Next up, we have surprise, surprise, Perman's back, and uh, here we have uh, we have Perman uh, again, and Perman will be presenting to us um, on geospatial programming with uh, with Russ. So, Perman, over to you. Yeah, now something completely different about programming with Rust. Uh, first, a few words about me. Um, in this case, my l programming language history. I started with basic and this was too slow. So I learned 8-bit assembler, then came Turbo Pascal, later University Motola, and also University C and C++. After university, I learned Java, later Eiffel, Perl, Ruby, JavaScript, Python, and finally in 2016, I learned Rust. And that's why I'm talking here. In my company, uh, we do development of geospatial software, mainly in C++, JavaScript, Ruby, but also in Rust, which is Turex Vector Tile Server. So, why Rust? Uh, a few benefits, performance. Rust has no um, language runtime, has no gar garbage collector. Um, you have low level control. Um, it is very memory efficient. Um, oops. It is reliable, it's a rich type system, and the compiler helps you to verify that your code uh, follows these types. Uh, and it has an ownership model, which guarantees memory safety and thread safety. That's one of the major um, speciali specialities of, of Rust. It doesn't have um, memory allocation and deallocation manually, but it has an ownership model, which detects uh, when when there is no ownership anymore of, of a variable, then it can um, free the memory of it. Productivity, a third advantage. It has great documentation, great tooling. I will tell you more about that. And it has a very friendly compiler, which finds a lot of errors, but also helps you to fix these errors. The history of Rust was originally developed at Mozilla Research as a private project, but later was adopted for writing an experimental browser engine, Servo. Um, it got to version 1.0 in 2015. And earlier this year, the Rust Foundation was uh, founded by AWS, Huawei, Google, Microsoft, and Mozilla as founding companies. Oh, now, a quick tour through the Rust language. Hello world, um, looks pretty familiar. The curly braces remind of C, C++, um, and that's all you need for hello world. Then some basic things, variables. Here you see on the first line, uh, the let statement, and you see that there is no type behind the X. So, um, it infers, it sees the five, it, uh, the compiler sees, okay, that's an integer, so X is of type integer. Um, the sec second thing you see is the error on line three. You can't assign another value to X because it's immutable by default. To fix that, if you want to have it mutable, you write let mute, and then you can assign other values as well. The Basic data types are these scalar types, integers, floating point numbers, which have explicit uh, bit lengths. Um, so not like in C where a long or an int can have different lengths. That's U size, I size, which are CPU dependent or system dependent. Uh, if you have a 32-bit system, then U size is 32-bit long. So you this is used for uh, integer in the indices um, things like that. There are more types, Boolean type, tuples, characters, arrays. So these are the, the basic compound types. 
Next functions. Um, this is a function area with two parameters of type u32, so unsigned integer, and the return type also u32. And maybe one special thing you notice is that there is no return statement because this is optional. So this is returning uh, an integer with um, and hate. And the, the call, the function call in the main function is as you would expect it. The most important control flow expressions, if expression uh, looks familiar, um, less braces than other languages, but still curly braces. Uh, oops, that's uh, no, I got the wrong. Here, while expressions. So you have while and then a, a condition. That's a bit familiar. For loops, here in this case, it iterates over uh, a value range, but this can also be another iterator, can be a, a vector, uh, iter iteration over, over a vector or something like that, or in, in a string characters. That's all the same for loop you can use there. Then um, if you have to more complex type, you want to have compound types, then there is this struct. Um, here in this case, a rectangle with two fields of type U32. And to create an instance of this type, you write this rectangle with curly braces and then assign the values to it. And then you can add methods to this struct like that. So we have this impl uh, statement, impl rectangle, and then you add a member method area, which takes self, the, the struct um, as a reference and returns um, this integer u32. To call this method, you need an instance. This was this rect we had on the other uh, slides and call the function. Uh, next data type is enumeration, enum. Here is a, a simple enum with three enumerations of image types. And to create an instance of that, it looks like that. You have the enum type first and then the, the enumeration you want to have. A speciality of Rust are enums with data. So you can add data to your enumerations. Here is a, a color enumeration with an RGB uh, variant, which has three uh, integers for R, G, and B, or a second one with, which is transparency. And th the instantiation looks like that. So you have the same as before, but with three numbers. So this is uh, a red color. Here comes also the match counter flow operator uh, into play. Uh, match is similar to this uh, switch case of C++, but with uh, uh, some more functionality. Uh, you can match also on these enum types I just showed. So the first match is on a RGB type and you can get the, the values out of the enumeration. And the second one is the transparent variant. Uh, similar use case is the if let statement. So a combination of if and let. Um, so if this color, which the color instance is of type RGB, color RGB, then it goes into that statement and prints R, G, and B. So that's very handy. We have also generic data types. So this is uh, a simple example, a point type, which is a generic X and Y type. So you can instantiate this, that with uh, integers. So that's the first example. 
So then you have this data type with integers, and the second one is with uh, floating point numbers. So that's a simple example for uh, generic types. Uh, often used generic type is option. Option type is either none or it is something of this type. So that's like often a, a replacement for null pointers in CC++ or this null value, this special value. Here you can use this enumeration functionality for have a, a, a clean type handling that. And this if let comes in also handy for that. So many um, functions return an option. So for instance, this pop of a vector, which either returns none if it's nothing left or returns some number. And with this if let some v, you can uh, get this value and go into the if statement if there is a value left. So you don't have to check of null or something similar. Then um, there are so-called traits, which are similar to interfaces in Java. Um, so we define here a, a trait called shape, which uh, has a method area. And to implement this trait, you write impl shape uh, for a struct. So the struct rectangle we had before. Um, and then you implement the method methods. Um, so that's this kind of inheritance, uh, or this gives you uh, object-oriented features of, uh, uh, like in other languages, um, but not with data inheritance, but with uh, um, inheritance of of traits. That's possible. So we can extend your structure is multiple, implementing multiple tra traits, uh, implement multiple interfaces. Um, so you have even uh, a kind of multiple inheritance. Then we have also closures, which are, is a functional language feature um, like iterators. So it's an anonymous function which captures the environment. So you see here an example in a for loop and the filter closure function. And there is much more. I can't show everything here. There is a concept of modules with private and public um, parts and members. There is good support for multi-threading. And there is also language support for asynchronous programming. So there is an async and await keyword. Um, there was a similar concept as, as JavaScript has. Um, so the JavaScript promises are futures in Rust. It's quite similar. Then the error handling is um, special in the sense that there is no exception handling like in other languages. So there's no try, catch, or similar, but you uh, return result types. That's similar to this option type I just showed. There is a result type which uh, returns either an okay result or an error. And then you check the result type. That gives you a very clean uh, error handling. And there is also a special operator which gives you shortcuts that um, so you can write this error handling very compact. Then there is an unsafe keyword, which disables the borrow checker. If you call external libraries, then the, the compiler can't check this ownership model. So you have to do that within an unsafe uh, block. These bindings to external languages, especially C, are very efficient because there's no overhead. You have a direct uh, conversion of C types to, to Rust types. And there are also macros, like in CC++. Uh, I have an example for a special type, the derived macros, which gives you functionality like serializing a struct. So you write this derive 
and then the serial, uh, there is a macro behind that which implements serializing methods for this struct. So this is very useful. The standard library of Rust contains functionality on primitive types, string functionality, arc, mutex, and so on. It has containers, collections, vectors, hash maps, iterators. It has support for IO, file IO, and network IO. It has multi-threading functionality and core macros like print and assert. So next slides are about tooling. As I said, Rust has excellent tooling. It has built-in testing. It has built-in benchmarks, uh, benchmark type tests. And it has also a built-in documentation generator. And um, by the way, all these are, you can follow the links on the slides. Um, all documentation is collected on a, on a central page, docrs, so you can look up almost every library there with high quality documentation. And the next big thing is Cargo, which is the name of the package manager of Rust. It manages all dependencies. It does also format code. It compiles your code. Uh, it runs applica the, the application, it runs tests, it creates the documentation, and it also creates packages for publishing, and you can even add your own commands. So it's extensible. And similar to the documentation, there is a create IO collecting third party libraries. There's where you publish your libraries and they are very easy to find, and you have all links, everything in one place, and there is a huge collection of crates. I promised also to talk about geospatial Rust, so the state of geospatial in Rust, and there are quite a few libraries around. So one thing is the Rust Geo library, which has point line strings and also polygons and algorithms for it. There is a spade, which is, uh, has also spatial data structures. And there's also a port of geographic lib with geodesic calculations. And if you need more, then you always have C bindings or bindings to C libraries like geos. Um, and ProEdge. But then you uh, usually have a runtime library dependency on Geos, uh, or some libraries you can compile statically or link statically like ProEdge, so you don't have runtime dependency. For geospatial formats, there is a rather young project, Geo0, which uh, is a new approach for reading and writing data without intermediate representation. So it should be um, very performant for conversions. And, but there are also uh, libraries for special formats or uh, like JSON, GeoJSON, TIFF are two libraries. And there is good support for flat geobuff, this uh, vector format. And there is also a library for uh, lighter data. And if you need more, Oops, sorry. If you need more, then you go to GDAL, which supports all formats, and there are uh, Rust bindings for GDAL. Some more crates, uh, PBF reader for OSM data, R star, a good R star library, and some more topics which are covered, raster image processing, uh, routing, 3D meshes, tins, F libraries, the are geocoding libraries, and there's also a map rendering library. And there are application free in Rust, 
that's two vector tile servers, T-Rex and Martin. Um, and other applications are white box tools, which is uh, maybe a little bit similar to grass, uh, uh, a toolbox mainly for raster algorithms, but also vector algorithms. And AB Street, which is also presented on this conference, is a traffic simulation game, uh, simulation game uh, written in Rust, compiled uh, natively or also for the web. The full list is here on this awesome GeoRust collection um, available. And there is an active community, mainly around the GitHub organization GeoRust, um, and people meet in a Discord chat and help uh, others when they have questions about your spatial functionality. So how can you learn Rust? Where to start? On the homepage, there is a special learn page with an online book and also other tutorials. But maybe you want to buy a paper book. So my recommendation is programming Rust. And yeah, my recommendation is to learn Rust. It's really worth it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Perman. That was uh, that was a good overview of, uh, of of Rust. I've never seen in my case. I've never seen any any work in Rust or in relation to Geo. So this is really interesting to see. Um, we have some questions, so I'll walk through them. First question. Are there many mature geo libraries available for Rust? And I know you showed some of them, but you, can you talk a little bit to the maturity of some of them? I would say they are not, the maturity is not the same as on CC++. It's really still in the beginnings. It's uh, also uh, most of the people working with Rust are from universities. So it's, uh, uh, maybe a different uh, view, uh, so it's not, um, so it's really good algorithms, but maybe not the same maturity for end users as you would expect. But um, I think the, the code quality is generally quite high. So but yeah, still not not the same level as, as this established languages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next question. What is the main advantage of migrating from C or C++ or Python to Rust? I, I think uh, projects migrating are often doing it because of security reasons, because the, the most security problems you have are uh, memory, um, uh, memory problems. If you make any mistakes in your program regarding memory handling, you have automatically security problems. So that's really a, a major argument for switching to Rust. And it's, it's, I think you're more productive, you have more libraries, and it's much easier to integrate other libraries. So I think that it's going step by step, but uh, it's, I'm, it's establishing uh, quite broadly. And um, really many companies, mostly big companies right now, so AWS and so on, they have their Rust groups, but I think also small companies, uh, maybe also in the IoT field, uh, so low level uh, um, applications, uh, real time and so on, where memory management is a topic. Next question. Do you think that it would be feasible for some of the OSG, OC, or C++ projects to progressively adopt Rust? Yeah, technically it's possible. Um, and it, it, other, projects are, other projects are doing it, like curl, maybe you heard of it. So he's replacing module by module with Rust, or that's his plan, but I mean, especially in, in the in the geospatial world, we have very like old projects, established projects. Um, so that's similar to curl, which is maybe 20 years old. Uh, so it is possible because you have C, C++ bindings. Um, 
Now, it, it, it depends on, on, on your application, but technically, especially for C++ projects, it's possible and it's, it's an option. And that's what they also did with, with Firefox. So they took out parts and, and wrote these parts in Rust. This can be done with geospatial projects as well. Cool. Next question. For someone with a C or C++ background, how much time does it take to be productive in Rust? Yeah, I didn't talk about this learning curve. <laughs> My um, impression is that the first steps are easy. So really, you you start with, with Cargo, write your hell world, and you write a bigger program. Uh, especially command line interface programs are very well suited. But then it's getting difficult. So it takes maybe, I don't know, a year or two or for some of them, a few months. But I, I think it, it really takes after that a year or two to really master a Rust. Uh, and then the curve gets steep again. Mm. But even before, I think produ productive, you're, you're quite, that's not, um, takes not a long time to be productive, but to really create high-level code and use the, the, the best features for, for your problem, this takes more time. For sure. Next question. Any words about Rust versus Julia for geocomputing? Hmm. I, I never worked with Julia. I know it's, uh, um, it's used in, in um, geospatial. Um, I mean, Julia is like a smaller language, so it's easier to learn. And Rust is quite a big language. You saw, and I even didn't show everything of it, and still were many slides. So I think if you you're quicker uh, with learning with Julia and um, with Rust, you have uh, so long term for bigger projects. I think then there you have the advantage of Rust. Next question. Can you say something about WebAssembly and Rust for building front ends? Yeah. Um, so Rust compiles to WebAssembly. That's very interesting. So you can compile natively or to WebAssembly. Um, for a, a front end, you, usually you still need classical web application. So you still need HTML and possibly JavaScript. Um, um, maybe if you if you write a WebGL um, application, then you can do everything in Rust, which is uh, then very easy. But usually you have you you need an interface to the to HTML and to JavaScript, and then it gets a little bit complicated. But I think it's one of the best supported languages, the uh, compiled languages for WebAssembly. What if we wanted to build like a like a like a web API. I mean, is there a concept of that in Rust, like with a web framework for routes and everything? Yes, there are really uh, like Flask-like uh, frameworks for Rust with asynchronous uh, mm -hmm. um, web servers built in. So there are good frameworks for that, yes. Excellent. Can uh, Rust bindings of C++ libraries such as GDAL and GS work as WebAssembly in the browser? Not directly, because you need the library itself. Uh, but um, as soon as you compile the C library also to WebAssembly, which is possible for some cases, um, then you can use it in the browser. And I think I saw both of them compiled to WebAssembly. I think it's not that easy to compile it to WebAssembly. And for GDAL, it's for sure not possible for every driver to compile it to WebAssembly, but the few drivers are possible, and then you, you could do it. Last question quickly. Uh, which programming language would you suggest to somebody just getting started in geospatial programming? I would start with Python, I think. Uh, it's easy to start. You, uh, you have uh, broad knowledge. I think it's easy. If you're really starting with programming, then my suggestion would be Python. Mm -hmm. But that's not a good last word for this talk. <laughs> so for yeah. all others, I would suggest Rust. Yeah, for, for, for sure, for sure. Every language has its uh, 
has this use case and has uh, the, the benefits of uh, using it. So I'd like I'd like to thank you, Perman, for a very interesting talk and taking us through a 101 of geospatial with Rust. I know on my, I know on my side I'm a Python hack, but I will definitely start looking into Rust. It sounds like uh, something very interesting and uh, and cool and fun to use. So thanks for walking us uh, uh, through this uh, presentation of geospatial and Rust. Thank you. Thanks.